All right. Oh, okay. And that's great. Oh, and do we, we have Judy and Joaquin? We're going to try a virtual panel discussion. Oh, there they are. Hello, Judy. Hello, Joaquin. Oh. You can hear us okay? Yes, oh. very clearly. Great. Excellent. Okay. Welcome back, everybody, online and in the room. Um, we've got a uh, panel discussion now on research data. And I'm just going to set the scene a little bit. Slide. All right. So, researchers. They create a lot of data, don't they? And um, it's the DNA of the knowledge creation process. They spend a lot of time gathering it and organizing it and analyzing it. But how many of them spend very much time thinking about how to curate and share it? That's what librarians and publishers and intermediaries are more involved with. All of us at this conference probably think more often and increasingly often about how data can and should be curated, made accessible, and I hope preserved for the long term as well. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. Research data then becomes not only the DNA of knowledge creation, with the increased use of research data for promotion and tenure decisions, it becomes the DNA of the university and the research ecosystem much more broadly. So we have three terrific panelists in discussion today. We will be hearing from Joaquin Jimenez, research data coordinator at UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico. We'll be hearing from Michael Levine Clark, who some of you might have seen at a dinner or a pub last night, um, Dean of Libraries at the University of Denver, and Judy Russell, the Dean of Libraries at the University of Florida. Um, could we start with Joaquin? Could you just tell us a little something about your university to put it in context, please? Well, thank you, Alicia. Uh, UNAM, as you say, is the National Autonomous University of Mexico. It's a huge university. We have more or less 300,000 uh, uh, students at all the university. We have more or less 20 campus in all the country. How you, how you can see is, is a, it's a huge problem to manage all the information in this very big university. Thank you, Joaquin. Michael, what would you say about UD? Yeah, so the University of Denver is a, um, a private uh, university. We just became an R1, which for those of you who pay attention to US classification systems is the top research classification. But we're a very small um, R1, very small research um, compared to, to um, many of those in that category. Um, we are about equally undergraduate and graduate student, and we are particularly strong in, um, in uh, psychology and the social sciences. Uh, we are a comprehensive university, but particularly strong in those areas. Cool, thank you. And Judy, what about UF? Judy, can you hear us? Otherwise, yeah. I can make up some stuff Here. about the University of Florida. <clears throat> can you hear me now? We yep. can. Thank you. Can. So the University of Florida is also an R1, but a very large R1. Um, we are just approaching a billion dollars in research and hope to cross that threshold this coming year. Um, <clears throat> we have a very active and engaged faculty with a very high volume of publication. and. Um, we're heavily a STEM university. About a third of our students are in graduate and professional programs. Brilliant. So we have panelists from three very different types of research intensive uh, organizations. What roles do each of you play in managing research data? Um, can I ask you to start, Judy? Would that be agreeable? Certainly. Um, and we have many roles in, in research data. Uh, our main partners across the campus are the Office of Research, 
the Office of the Chief Information Officer, and the Associate Deans for Research from all 16 colleges. And together we serve the entire set of colleges, 150 research centers, and the clinical presence as well. Um, we have a number of official roles in the management of research and research data. We're the official site for guidance on funder requirements for deposit of articles and data on behalf of the Office of Research. And our liaison librarians and subject specialists are trained to assist authors or refer them to experts for assistance. We are a founder and active participant in UF Research Computing Advisory Committee. There are 30 members from across the campus, three of them from the libraries, the Associate Dean for Research and Health Sciences, the Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives and Partnerships, and the Data Management Librarian. Our data management librarian plays a particularly important role. He assists with the development of achievable and reasonable data management plans and their implementation. Early plans prior to hiring the data management librarian were not always reasonable or achievable. Participant, he participates in grants with academic faculty and is the PI for one major grant with significant data implications. He leads the university-wide data management and curation working group. And as funder requirement, as with the funder requirements, our liaison librarians and subject specialists are trained to offer basic assistance to researchers for their data management issues but also then to refer them to the data managed li librarian for assistance when that's needed. We maintain an institutional repository called IR at UF uh, for the deposit of papers and posters and presentations and the related small to moderate sized data sets. Most of our data sets are large to very large and they go to Hypergator, the computer managed by the CIO, which has significantly more capacity for manipulation and storage of data but we work with them to enhance the metadata and to facilitate tagging and linking of research documentation and the associated data. And we also offer our researchers services like geographic information services, data visualization, text and data mining and others um, to help them with the use of data sets. And we license Chorus, which we're gonna talk about later to help identify published articles and track compliance with deposit mandates for articles and data. Our big issue, as we'll also talk about later, is scale, uh, because we really are seeking for many of these things automated solutions because it's just too large to do manually. That's brilliant. And I, I wonder if other people in the researcher to reader community are as surprised as I am to hear what, a, what an operation that is, how systematic it is, and the number of people being deployed on research data management in the library at UF. Joaquin, is it the same for you in Mexico? Or are you the only research data coordinator? How, do, how does it work for you? Well, uh, well, at UNAM, a special office was created to manage research data at the end of 2018. This is a general directive of university repositories, DGRU, and its main objective is to develop and implement technologies, methodologies, and technical and legal regulations for the university's digital repositories. For us, it's important to guarantee the online publication of digital and scientific collection and research data that are property or they are under the custody of UNAM. Our goal is to promote interoperability, open access, and digital preservation. Uh, preservation of, of research data. Since its creation, the DGRU has been in charge of developing, managing, organizing, implementing, and putting into operation two digital platforms, the Institutional Repository of UNAM and the University's Open Data Portal, which is in my charge. And at this portal, uh, we mainly publish scientific collection and research data. At this moment, there are more than 2 million registration published. We are currently too working on developing a third platform by the end of this year, I hope. This will be a portal for publishing only research data sets. The university's open data portal is an online access point for consulting data from university collections that bring together collections that are physically dispersed. In this way, data from different collections can be consulted 
to, uh, through this portal, a new set of information can be created. This consultation system is possible thanks to the application of protocols, procedures, and specialized methodology for the integration and publication of data from collection of, of different nature and origin, which includes standardization and uh, a very important quality control process. This portal uses a standardized database that integrates tabular and geospatial data and digital objects through web services. And we are more or less, we are uh, 15 uh, staff working on this project, uh, managing this, these platforms. Awesome. Thank you, Joaquin. Uh, Michael, what are you guys up to in Denver? Um, we are probably going to be less surprising to you than, than Judy's answer because we are not nearly as well organized um, or as large a uh, scale operation. Uh, so we have no formal data role in the library. There is no position with data in the, in the job title other than metadata. Um, there is no um, uh, mandate from the university to do anything with, with data. Uh, there is no formal partnership with IT or anybody else on campus, and yet we're doing the work, right? We are, we have taken it on because it has to be done, um, but we're not doing it as well as we probably should be. So um, a decade or so ago, we, we actually pulled together a, a group of people from IT, from institutional research, from the Office of Research, and from the library, and, and um, surveyed faculty tried to get a sense of what data sets were out there and what the data needs were. Um, and we've used that, that data, but we, we were hoping at the time that that, would, that sort of informal group that we pulled together would become a data team that would manage this for, for the university. And that, that never happened. And for various reasons, um, most of those people in that original working group have left the university. Um, and, and, and so it sort of, um, exists on paper in a sense, but doesn't exist in, in reality. Um, we are managing uh, research publications, and we've, we've, we've actually been, been working really closely with the Office of Institutional Research to clean up all of the metadata about faculty publications in, um, in our campus reporting system, Activity Insight, which is a, a digital measures tool, right? And so many universities are requiring their faculty to enter data about publications. And this is a, this is a process that faculty don't really like. And, and we've taken on this, this work of, of cleaning that up and, and really trying to, um, to help the university highlight the publications of our faculty. And in that process, we're doing some work with data, but, but um, it's, it's not part of this formal, um, formal, formal process. Um, we, one of the problems in not having um, a formal structure is that we use the institutional repository as a place to house data, right? So it is, it is not designed for that, it's designed for publications. And we have, um, I'll just give you two examples. We have a, um, a, a huge data set of images and data about knees. Um, uh, human knees from from cadavers, and it's 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 hundreds of thousands of images of knees that are that are uh, actually apparently a very um, valuable data set for for people who want to study um, sort of the structure of 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 that part of the body, and yet we have it housed as these individual zipped images in in an institutional repository that's essentially designed for, for, for PDFs. Um, and then the other one that we have is, is, is a, a large data set of, of um, environmental data around sort of the, the emissions of, of, of automobiles from around the world and tracked over, over um, I think in 21 locations at over 35 or so years. And it's just this massive data set that is again, 
in the institutional repository and not in something designed specifically for numerical data. Um, and so, and we have many, many more examples of that sort of thing. And I think we also have, I know we also have examples of things that are just not being um, retained in the university's formal structures, right? They're on departmental um, servers, they're on people's personal hard drives, um, they are um, perhaps even in something like Dropbox, right? We, we, we don't have much control over it, and it's a, it, it's a big worry, um, and, and something that I think we as, a, as the library need to be um, pushing a little harder on, and we as an industry need to be um, trying to figure out how to standardize. Cool. So, Michael, while, you, while, the, while the cameras are on okay. you and the, the, the spotlight is on you, if you had to pick out one of those as a key challenge, to you, what is, it, what is it? Is it money? Is it the formal mandate? Is it the metadata? What what is keeping um, you awake? So I think I think it's the the overarching problem is that there's no formal mandate, um, and therefore we don't have a position, and we then and we don't have we have not then invested in the server space and all of the other stuff that you need to do to make this work, right? So um, it I mean so it's it's fundamentally money, but but the fact that the university has not um, decided yet that this is something that the library should be doing right, is the problem, right? So it's, 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 it's not perceived by the university or by the faculty at the university as, as a library role. Um, so maybe that's the, the biggest issue. That makes sense, cool. Yeah. Judy, it's clearly different in Florida. You, you do have a formal role, but what is your biggest challenge at the minute in managing research data? We have a number of challenges. Um, I would say, and I'll come back to that, that our biggest challenge is simply scale. Um, we really need accurate identification of our authors with the correct college affiliation. So we need ORCID, we need official UF email addresses for an automated match for our authors to the directory information. We do have an ORCID membership and we actively encourage its use with graduate students as soon as they arrive. So we're training the next generation, but we still have a lot of work to do with our established researchers. We need funder IDs to match with the UF Office of Research Grant Database. Um, we are managing and working on understanding the multiple funder requirements and documenting them. And that does allow us to understand common and uncommon requirements and to assist our authors with compliance, particularly when they receive a grant from a newer and frequently used funder, but it's a challenge to keep up with all of that. Um, but again, I would come back to that, although we have a variety of sources like Chorus and Web of Science and Scopus and Academic Analytics, and we get reports from our transformative and read and publish agreements that identify research publications and data from our authors, and we can run reports on that and we can help them learn to run the reports themselves. Our biggest challenge just simply remains the scale. There's just so many researchers, we're so distributed. Uh, the ratio of those folks to our librarians is significant and, and pre presents a challenge. We serve over 50,000 students, more, of a third, more than a third of whom are graduate and professional programs, but many of our undergraduates are also in research and 5,200 faculty who publish over 8,400 articles a year. So if you try to imagine what it's like to be tracking that information and trying to work with all those people, um, we're just vastly outnumbered and stretched thin. So we're searching for and actively considering development of automated tools to enable us to meet the demand for these services efficiently. And we do try to anticipate and prepare for the needs of the researchers and authors, but data management is the newest and greatest challenge. Uh, the whole issue of preservation and access is still being worked out. Uh, there's just new funder requirements compared to journal articles, which are relatively easy. The new requirements for data um, are being faced with trepidation because the scale is different of the data sets themselves and the variety of fields and formats are variable and complex. Um, we often refer to a quote from Varsha Kodyar from Springer Nature who said, for research just to cite papers is second nature and no one thinks twice about it, but we need to get them to think about data in the same way. And I think that is a part of the whole education process we're all going through is to um, 
try to get our authors to be more sensitive to the need to actually cite and to find the correct ways to cite and link data. So um, I could go on about that for a while, but again, I think the challenge is how do we step up to that challenge? How do we uh, deal with the massive amount of data and the number of people who need our assistance? Thank you for sharing that um, set of pain points. And uh, Joaquin, what's your biggest challenge at the minute with research data? Well, uh, at DGRU, we have identified three biggest, uh, three different types of challenges. There are legal challenges, professional and technical challenges. About legal challenges, there are three important principles for us. Data must not have intellectual property conflicts. Mm -hmm. Second, the university must recognize open licenses or creative commons licenses for sharing data and the obligations and rights for bots, authors and users must be published. Moving on to professional challenges, one of the main obstacles to the publication of open research data at UNAM is that in many cases, it is not considered in the academic evaluation process of researchers. For this reason, it is very important to promote the publication of open research data as another element in the academic evaluation of researchers. In the case of the DGRU, we, we issue certificates every year to all those who participated in the data publication process so that they can use them for their evaluation. Furthermore, many scientists are dubious to share their data since it can be used by other research groups to and lose the possibility of publishing it themselves. These suspicions, which in many cases is well founded, can be used to achieve greater collaboration between different research groups. Uh, at UNAM, we have decided to not publish in, uh, the files in, that contains essential data for ongoing research, pointing out that these data are reserved and for use, one must contact the researcher responsible for the project with whom a collaboration can be agreed on. Data that is not essential for, for research, but is of significant value to other subjects or projects should be published openly with any, any restrictions. And lastly, in, in the technical challenges, not all data should be handled in the same way. In the case of UNAM, we handle two types of different data. First, first, collection data, where each data unit corresponds to a specimen of a scientific collection. For example, a record at the National Herbarium or a specimen in the bird collection. This kind of data can be consulted for each record independently and are in a constant quality control and update process because they are reference material that are continually curated by academic staff. The second type of data are those from research projects. This data is collected or generated to answer research questions and often support the publication of papers. In this case, data must be consulted as a world data, the data sets because, because it supports the publication of papers. Only the metadata can go through a quality control process, not the content. And uh, well, regarding quality control, we, have a, we apply it in, uh, to the data only with collection data and we use catalogs so that the presence of error is reduced and the data is of quality, consistent and up to date. And cool, thank you, Joaquin. Now we're gonna kind of shift in the conversation at the minute. And so everybody out there in the post coffee slump, it is time to wake up and engage. <laughs> um, and online as well. I don't know if you're having your breakfast or preparing for bed, but please wake up. Um, we need comments, suggestions, rants, provocations. Those can come through the chat if you're online or um, through Twitter or via a microphone if you're in the room. I'm going to ask the library colleagues 
just to tell us their one big thing that would help them overcome some of the barriers they face in managing data. And then we're going to talk about the role that publishers and intermediaries can play in this. And I'm really hoping that all of you service providers, your ears are pricked up and you're thinking about fantastic ways to make money in this space. <laughs> and you will come forward and reveal your big vision to all of your competitors right here, right now. Yes, okay. So Joaquin, let's start with you. What would help you overcome your challenges in managing research data? Well, to us, uh, it's, it's obviously the, the importance and urgency of publishing data set associated with, with papers. Uh, at UNAM, there are more, uh, less than 1% of, of papers published linked to, to data. That means uh, we need to promote the publication of research data through the development of the data collection and data set portals. But we consider that research funders should, uh, should motivate projects that include as a part of their products, the publication of data or data linked with papers. Uh, also, it's, it is relevant that the evaluation of the researchers consider the publication of data as a part of the research work. Uh, in Latin America, we have, uh, there are few clear mandates on open access, particularly in Mexico. In Mexico, the mandate was given on 2014, although it is not legally binding, but the Furthermore, universities should index uh, their journals in international networks such as Web of Science or in regional networks such as Cielo. Uh, Cielo is a, is a regional journal network whose main objective is to increase the dissemination and visibility of the scientific publication and data set in Latin America. But, uh, as a way to promote them. Thank you, Joaquin. Michael. Um, so quickly, I would just say that, it, that, that if I could wave a magic wand yes. and, and solve the problem, um, we would have a change in culture so that data is sort of treated the same way um, and, and um, valued in the same way as the publications, right? So that, that faculty are, are judged by the quality of their data sets and universities are judged by it and therefore um, the, the sort of library would, would be tasked with um, managing that important resource. So that's my magic wand. And then since I've still got the magic wand in my hand, we'd also have standards in place that would allow us to um, describe and manage um, data across institutions. Thank you. Judy? So I agree with both of them. I think they have pinpointed the, the things that we would most value. Um, I do think that we, we also need to uh, have those incentives that were mentioned in terms of both through the tenure and promotion process and through the grants themselves that uh, value the data sets. And we have a huge challenge to educate um, and facilitate the work of our researchers and overcome some of the cultural obstacles to, as well as the tangible ones for managing those data sets. We have a lot of work to do. Excellent. So the question for all of us now collectively in the researcher to reader community, how can publishers, intermediaries and funders help libraries manage research data? So we wanna hear from everybody. And to just set the scene for that, can we switch over to the slides for just a minute, please? Publishers are already helping libraries through services like Chorus, and we'll hear a little bit more about that in just a minute. But I found this slide that our panelists put together kind of interesting. They're showing for each institution what the top 10 publishers with whom their authors uh, publish might be. Um, Elsevier, Wiley, Springer, probably unsurprisingly important in this perspective for all three institutions. But the really exciting thing, beyond those big three, 
The publishers that are potentially best placed to help each library are radically different depending on the subject areas that are strengths on every individual campus. So a takeaway point is that no single organization is likely to be able to wave that magic wand and fix these problems. It's only through collective action, um, crossing stakeholder communities that we have any hope whatsoever. And you were going to say something about this. I was going to say this. something about this slide. So, so this is, um, uh, we thought it would be useful to, to talk briefly about Chorus, which is an organization that is pulling together data from funders and publishers to try to, to help um, keep track of compliance with US federal, um, mostly US federal government m mandates. Um, Chorus is pulling data in from a huge number of sources, and, and, and you can see them here, and is, is using existing structures to try to get information about, about compliance. Um, some of this requires uh, that our faculty participate in these things, right? So if a researcher doesn't have an ORCID, it doesn't help that get into this stream. If a researcher doesn't have um, or if an institution's uh, uh, ROAR isn't on there, it doesn't get into the stream and so on. So, so using these existing standards is, is valuable. Um, and I think we'll go to the, the next slide. And um, then we're gonna, we've got questions, so we'll right, go to those right. after yeah. this. So this is just really quickly, to, um, uh, this is a Chorus dashboard, and, and University of Denver and University of Florida are existing Chorus participants, and we, we've, we've um, spun one up for UNAM as well. I want to, this is, this is data about sort of compliance, and I just want to track, just draw your attention to one thing. Of the, of the um, 1,300 publications that have been tracked to date for University of Denver, only 2.7% of them have an associated data set. Um, and it's very likely that many of them don't have one. But it's, it's also very unlikely that only 2.7% of them were developed without data, right? So there's a big gap here. Um, University of Florida, it's the same, and, and, um, and I don't know that we need to, here's just quickly the, the data sources yeah, that fine. we come don't from, worry. that we bring in, right? I don't wanna, I don't wanna sort of draw on it, but, but there, there's, you know, this is just a sort of a quick understanding of what's, of what's, available um, in Chorus. University of Florida is the same, 3.1% um, data sets on 30, I can't read it from here, but 20, 29,000 publications, I think, um, and um, only 0.8%, um, uh, but again, this is tracking mostly US federally funded research, right? So it would not be surprising that the number is lower for, for a Mexican university. So just quickly thought it would be worth showing those and then... Um, Let, let's pause there. Yeah. So I think that is very interesting. Actually, data sets linked to formal publications can be powerful um, aids, but very low percentages of articles with that linked data at the minute. Let's come over uh, first live, and then we have a question via Twitter. Um, Bernie Follin from OASPA. Thank you. Thanks. Um, this is, was a, a, qu a comment that maybe is a suggestion, I hope. So my ears pricked up when you said knees and cars or automobiles. And I know how important research data is, but my, I get a little bit woozy and my kind of, I get, it's not the most sexy terminology. <laughs> and um, many important things, infrastructure things and, and nuts and bolts, aren't the, 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 the easiest things to sell. So it just made me think when you said that, I want to hear more about what these needs and these. And then I thought, well, maybe we need to do a better job as a community. So the people who can, publishers potentially, I'm thinking about organizations like Kudos as well, could you know, help to just you know, it bring to life the story behind some of these data sets in a more kind of easy, palatable way. Because oftentimes also the money that's needed to do this work doesn't come from the people that understand <laughs> what's needed, and we need to make them stand up and listen. So, just something about public awareness, or or bringing some of these stories to life, to to use that to to propel, you know, the understanding of the importance of this stuff. 
I, I think that's, that's a cool. great suggestion. Um, do, I'm gonna just, do, do we want to put our other speakers back on the screen Oh, for that's now? a good that idea. A, if we could do that, that's an excellent suggestion. Let's go to um, Heather Staines from Delta Think next. Hi, your slide that had all of the different, you know, connections with, with Crossref and DataSite and the like. Um, there's one um, thing that's, that's, that's missing, I think should be there, we should definitely have conversations about, which is GetFTR. Um, Chorus actually uses the GetFTR entitlements API to make sure that content is open and it could probably be, um, you know, worked into the process around some of the, the data sets and the like. We're just starting. Uh, I've been doing work for GetFTR for about 18 months. We're just starting actually to have conversations with institutions where they say, hey, the things that we fund with our APCs, we want to make sure those are actually open. And you could use the um, GetFTR entitlements API to do that as well. So um, just wanted to draw attention to that. So. Thank you for that, Heather. Um, panelists, I'm just going to um, go through. There are two more comments online and then a question and then hand it back over to you all. And Judy, I think I'll start with you when we do that, if that's okay. So okay. Um, there was a comment from Kimberly Powell. Uh, she writes, as a librarian, I think we need funder mandates as the magic wand. Mandates will mean institutions will prioritize staff and monies to ensure continued fundability, they will look for expertise that may well end up in libraries. Mandates will trickle into the promotion tenure packages as data availability and data quality will join publication metrics as a proxy, blah, as a proxy for fundability and success. And a comment from Philomene Pupula, I'm sorry if I have mispronounced your name. Publishers and funders could help libraries with technical aspects of setting up data repositories and linking repository contents to publish articles. And then a question for you panelists. This is from Simon Horton. I'm interested in your reliance as institutions on third-party vendors for research data support. I read recently about a data scientist based in Utah who'd been told that the unlimited server storage promised them a few years previously by Google was being limited to 100 terabytes, leaving them only two months to transition over a half a petabyte of data to a new server. Do you as a panel have any thoughts on how to ensure perpetual access and security of your data in the long term? Is this something you're actively thinking about? Judy, do you want to talk oh, about I'd like one? to comment on one of the comments and then answer that question. Um, I think the problem with funder mandates, to a large extent, they exist and more and more are coming into being, but they are unfunded mandates. And so uh, what they're doing is pushing uh, demands, which are reasonable in the sense of this is all information we want, but it doesn't necessarily easily result unless they're accompanied by funding uh, to fulfill those mandates. It doesn't necessarily help us fulfill it. But to the question, and it's a very interesting one, the University of Florida is large enough, and I don't think we would ever say we were wealthy, but we have prioritized our resources enough that we have very large capacity that we manage ourselves. So I'm sure there is some data that is out there in the cloud and with other kinds of third-party services, but most of our data is actually residing on our own computers, including a new computer that we've just installed that is um, an artificial intelligence, amazing artificial intelligence capacity. And we need to be able to both manage those data sets and manipulate them on our own servers. So um, I think we may have, at least for the moment, dodged that particular bullet. Uh, Michael and Joaquin may have other experiences where they are. Cool. Now I'm conscious of time. Thanks to Anna Sharman, who is our operator, and she's the person channeling through questions online and from Twitter. Um, we have a live comment or question from Phil Jones from More Brains. Um, yeah, so I thought I was about to be um, provocative, as you just um, suggested, but I'm going to say a shade of similar to what Judy said, um, which is about, um, I guess, about funding and about infrastructure. So mandates are, and incentives are, of course, great. Um, but all the mandates and all the incentives in the world will only be of limited value unless there is adequate infrastructure with enough scale and enough standards and enough interoperability for researchers to be able to upload their data. So in my personal experience and uh, you know, of, of, the, of the research ecosystem, 
that infrastructure simply doesn't exist. So, or to at least to the scale and to the level of standardization that is necessary to support many researchers. So I guess it's a question to the panel of to what extent um, are we held back by a lack of a larger strategy? Uh, something similar to what, say, Australia does with the Australian Research Data Commons and their national infrastructure strategy. Uh, is that what we need in other countries? Uh, do we need something global around a, a, a strategy with some more teeth? Brilliant question and flying the flag for our Australian colleagues who are hopefully asleep now. <laughs> right, we have two minutes. Um, how about Michael, Joaquin, and then Judy for the last word. Okay, um, yeah, so Phil, I think um, there has to be something at scale um, and it, it, it needs to be multinational. Uh, the funder mandates are often happening at the national level, at least in the US, but the, for this to be done well, it needs to be, um, whether it's funded research or not, it needs to be whether there's um, one funder for the research or multiple funders for the research. Uh, authors write papers together from different institutions and from different countries. And so um, a, an infrastructure that, that truly manages data that benefits everybody needs to, it needs to be outside of the institution and it needs to be even um, beyond the, the national level. So I think, I think a broad scaled in infrastructure um, is the answer that we need. Um, how, how that happens and how it gets funded is a different question, but I think it's, it's essential to have um, something in place, um, standards and technology to allow this to happen. That's brilliant. Joaquin, is Cielo the answer for Central and South America? Is this a problem solved or do you oh, also no, think no, a strategy no, and no, some shared infrastructure would be good? Well, in, in Latin America, uh, where resources for research are low, uh, in addition to sharing data, we must learn to share resources uh, to achieve it. We need to, to share, uh, standardize uh, the, 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 the data, uh, access to interoperability platforms, use, um, I don't know, we need to share all the resources and the infrastructure. Thank you, Judy. Yes. Can you close us out, please? Yes, and I, I have to agree once more with my colleagues and that is perhaps the largest challenge of all. It's a challenge to do it even within our own countries. It's a challenge to do it sometimes even with our, within our own um, states or, or regions. Uh, but we do need multinational tools and we need to be sure that we're supporting um, the sharing of data with and from the less developed and less well-resourced countries. So I think it is something where we need to put our best brains and best uh, efforts forward, not to be quite so provincial in thinking about these as uh, national or, or regional mandates and to look more broadly. And I hope we can, we have many of the people in the room who could help us begin that process. But ultimately a lot of it is going to come down then to legislative processes and getting our national governments to cooperate with one another and share resources. And that's a, a very large challenge. Awesome. Thank, thank you all. I'm sure this is a, a theme that will continue to recur at Researcher to Reader. Um, can I ask everybody to join me in thanking Joaquin, Judy, and Michael. They've prepared an enormous amount of material um, in, in preparation for this conversation today. And I've learned a lot from being part of that process. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.